Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, Night Dialer. This is a pretty interesting one, I actually like this problem. A bit of backstory, in the game chess there is a piece called the knight and it can move in a sort of unique way. It can move in an L shape. It can kind of go in four directions, initially at least. It can go two spaces in either of those four directions and then it kind of branches. It can either go one space in like the perpendicular direction to the first one or it can go the other way. And in doing that you realize that there's about eight different ways to move as a knight assuming there's enough space in the grid now the problem we are dealing with is different we definitely don't have that much space so we can't make eight moves with the knight and we're actually in this problem dialing a phone number so i'll make a little space here because we're going to use it now we are dialing a phone number that is n digits long that's the only parameter that we're given so of course if we only have a single digit to fill in how many phone numbers could we possibly dial? That's the question that we're trying to answer. And with one digit, of course, you can only do 10 phone numbers. But in this problem, as we add more digits, it's going to get more complicated because the rules of the game are that our knight can start at any of these 10 positions and then to dial a phone number, we are only allowed to make valid moves with the knight. So valid, of course, means we can't go out of bounds. It also means that we can't land on anything that is not a number or digit. So the first thing you might notice is that five can't really go anywhere. I mean, theoretically, it could move here and here. These are valid knight moves, but we can't land on either of these spots and the knight can't really move anywhere else. The grid is just too small, right? But what about the other spots? Like zero is also a bit unique in this case, but it can actually make valid moves. It can move to the six or it can move to the four. And similarly, like the diagonals are actually pretty symmetrical. This one can either move to here or it can move down here. This one is kind of similar. It can move there and it can also move here. And each of these will be able to move somewhere. And the sides, I call kind of these the crosses or like the left, right, top, bottom. These ones are similar in that there is some symmetry between them. Like this one can go here. It can go here. This one can go here. It can go here. Bottom one similarly can go there and it can go here. There's actually a bit of a difference between the tops and bottom and the left and right because the left and right are special they are the only ones that can go all the way down here to the zero and the six can go to the zero as well now if you're anything like me you're probably looking for as many patterns as you can you want to simplify this if you know a bit of geometry you can kind of tell obviously that there's so much symmetry going on that there's not a lot of difference like there's no difference whether we're on this diagonal or this diagonal or this one so you might try to simplify the problem and that's not a bad thing to do, but the problem is simple enough that we actually don't need to do anything. We can very much, in my opinion, brute force this problem. You might not consider it a brute force solution, but just because our solution is not going to be inefficient, in my opinion, doesn't mean it's not like a brute force because we are going to think of it in this way. For every digit, we can kind of build, you can think of it like the decision tree that we usually make or even like a state machine if you are familiar with those. Basically, we will, for every single digit, any digit can be the starting point. We can start at one, two, three, four, five, etc. I won't draw all of this out because it's going to be pretty big. But one, it can go to the eight. It can go to the six. Cool. So let's write that down. Eight and six. Each of these will have something like that. Two can go to seven and nine. And we could, of course, fill in the rest of these. And you kind of will need to to solve the problem, at least with this solution I'll show you. But I'll also show you the approach that takes advantage of the symmetry of this problem. Five, of course, can't really go anywhere. And I won't fill out the rest of this. But basically, for every number, there is a mapping of the other numbers it can land on. So what we are going to do is we are going to, for every digit, we're going to count 
the number of ways we could land on this digit. Like as we build that decision tree, you can imagine it's going to be big depending on what our end value is. And we obviously want to count how many phone numbers we could create with that. In terms of like the sequence or an individual sequence, you can think of like the phone number one and then maybe the one goes to the eight and then the eight goes to the three. This is one possible sequence. Maybe another sequence would have been instead of three from eight, we actually end up going uh, back to one. But mainly what we want to know is how many ways could we land on each number at the end? For example, I think four will lead us to three as well. And to get to four, maybe we started at nine or something like that. So maybe there's two different ways we ended up getting to three. We want to keep that in mind. So that's why I'm having this uh, data structure. We can use an array or a hash map, but basically for each number, we want to know how many ways can we get to that last digit. And initially, since we are starting with just a single digit, any of these can be the starting point, which is also the last digit so far. So like for how many ones do we have? We have a single so far. How many twos do we have? A single for all of these. Of course, I'm not drawing out all 10 digits because I just want to show you the intuition of this. We will code up the entire solution, of course, though. Now we want to know how many ways can we land on one if we had two digits. How do you figure that out? Well, you kind of have to think about it a little bit in reverse. The question is, how can we land on one? Which digits will take us to one? Basically, eight will take us to one, or I believe six will take us to one. So far, we know that six probably also has a one here and eight does as well. I won't draw that out. If we have two digits, how many ways can we end with a one? Two. So here we'll put a two value, which is eventually going to replace this. And we're going to fill these values in for every single one. So how many ways can we land on two? Well, two is here. We can go from seven to two or nine to two. The values for seven and nine would be one if we had them filled in here, which uh, right now we don't. But basically, we take those one plus one, add them together, put two over here. So that's the idea. And you can imagine like at some point we might get like a bunch of random values here, maybe a five here, six. I'm just making this up, by the way, four, four, uh, five. If we get to the point where now we want to know, like for the next digit, now we have additional digits, the next digit, how many ways can we land on one? We would take the value from whatever it was, six and eight, and then take those, add them together. And then we get the new value here. And we're going to do that row by row for every single value in here. And we're going to do that for every single digit. And by the time we get to the end, what we would do is aggregate all of these together. Take the sum of all of these because, OK, we had this many phone numbers that ended with a one. We have this many phone numbers that ended with a two. We have this many phone numbers that ended with a three, et cetera, et cetera. And the number can be really, really big. So they do tell us to mod it by this number. So that's pretty much all you need to know to solve this problem. Now, in terms of time complexity, since we are iterating over this guy, it's going to be 10. How many times are we going to have to iterate over this whole thing? N times, one for each digit. So overall time complexity is just going to be big O of N. Space complexity is just going to be big O of 10, which is constant. So not a lot of extra space needed for this problem. Now let's code this up. So there is one case that I'm going to explicitly handle because it makes just coding this up easier. If n is equal to 1, we're just going to immediately return 10. And the reason is because when n is 1, we actually include the middle, which was 5, in like the phone numbers. But every other phone number is never going to include 5. If it's ever longer than one digit, we will never be able to include 5 because 5 Five is like a dead end. We can't go anywhere from five. Next, I'm going to declare this guy, which is just going to be 10 to the power of nine plus seven. And now here's the part where I'm going to represent the jumps. This is like our state machine. You can think of it as for zero. I guess I will open up the side panel just to make it very, very clear. I won't go through all of these, but zero over here can go to four and six. So we're going to map it to this. And when I say zero, I'm saying that because this is index zero. One can go to, I believe, eight and six. So let's have that here. And I'm just going to copy and paste the rest of them. You probably don't want me to type all of these out. So let me do that now. And notice here that the five just has an empty list because it does not map to anything. Okay, now to do the implementation, 
we are going to initialize an array. I'm gonna call it DP, but it doesn't really matter. This is technically dynamic programming, though we didn't really talk about it in the drawing explanation because I don't think like the recursive solution is really that helpful for understanding this. Here, I'm going to have an array of length 10. It's gonna be initialized to all ones. Remember from the drawing explanation, that represents how many ways we can land on each digit. So I will leave a quick comment, ways to land on digit I, or I guess I th digit would be probably uh, more descriptive. Now we just need to fill in the rest of the digits. So that's what the outer loop here is going to be. Maybe I shouldn't use I because I just uh, used it in the comment above. So I'll put an underscore here, but for underscore in range, n we're actually going to do n minus one because the first digit was free every single one of these could be like a starting point theoretically even though we know five does not go anywhere and this empty list will actually handle that so here we're going to do n minus one we just need to fill in the rest of the digits except the first one now we are going to declare a temporary array i'm going to call it next dp it's going to be initially all zeroed out and we're doing this because we don't want to overwrite this array before we end up getting to use like the original values from that array. Okay, now we are going to go digit by digit. So we're gonna go for n in range 10. n is gonna represent which digit we are currently at. So for this nth digit, instead of calculating the number of ways we can land on this digit, let's use this digit to map to what other spots we can land on so like this jumps at index n and for these jumps let's loop over them because then for j in jumps we can compute the number of ways we can land on this digit so we can say that next dp at index j is gonna be equal to next dp at index j plus dp at index n. What does this mean? Remember dp of n is the number of ways we could land on like the nth digit. And now from the nth digit, we are allowed to jump to this spot. So we're just taking from here, adding it to here, because if we could land on n this many different ways, then we can definitely land on j that many ways as well. Like uh, looking at the example here, we know that zero can land on four and six. So if zero can land on four x many ways, then we should add that x to the count of four. And that's kind of what we're doing here. I know that like code wise, this does look a bit different than how we talked about it in the drawing explanation. I think that's just kind of the nature of the way like these jumps work and the way to code this up more easily is to kind of take advantage of these. We're nearly done. The last thing we have to do is if we have next DP, we definitely don't want to forget to assign it to the original DP before we go to the next iteration of the loop. That's more or less the entire code. Now we can get away with doing this in Python Python. The last thing we just need to do now is just take the sum of DP and then mod it by mod. And we can get away with this in Python. But the reason I wrote this line out fully is because in most languages, you will not be able to do that. Most languages are not like Python. They don't have arbitrarily large integers. So here I'm going to take this, put it in parentheses and add the mod here. And when we calculate this, this could theoretically overflow in other languages. So a better way to do this would be to have like a result variable here, initially at zero, then for, uh, let's say n in dp, uh, take result, set it to result plus n, and then mod that as well. And then we can just go ahead here and return result. So this is pretty much the entire code. Let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. Okay, so here is actually a slightly different approach. And this one takes advantage of the symmetry of like the problem statement, though I will say this is not necessarily more efficient. I mean, it technically is because we have like a smaller array here that we're managing, but I wanted to just briefly go over some of the intuition of this. My naming was a bit different from the way LeetCode explained it. So I did kind of add these letters here, A, B, C, D. That's how a LeetCode was explaining it, which is why I have it. But I wanted to just quickly show you this. 
we have actually groups. When I talked about the diagonals and how they are pretty much identical, what I meant is that here we have four diagonals, right? And each diagonal can move to what I call the crosses, which is like the top, bottom, and left, and right. So from four different diagonals, we can land on eight different spots. Half of them will be the top and bottom and the other half will be the left and right. Now from the bottom, it's a pretty simple one. We can only land on the left or the right. We basically are putting these cells and forming groups with them. The diagonals go into one group because there is symmetry between them. You might think, isn't there symmetry with the top, bottom, as well as the left and right? Why can't we put those in one single group? And that's because the top and the bottom, they can move to diagonals. Each one can go to a diagonal, but the left and right are unique. They also go to diagonals, but they can also move to the bottom cell. They're the only ones that can move to that zero. So that's what's unique for these ones. We just take this information. Of course, the middle one can't move anywhere. So I have that here as well, but we basically take this information and do a similar thing that we were doing earlier, just without all the looping, because we can just form formulas with these now, because we only have four of them. We probably could have done this as well with the other 10, but it would be hard to kind of write out 10 formulas. Even these four formulas were kind of annoying to uh, write out. But I won't go like super in depth into this. I think honestly, Elite Code's code might have actually been a bit cleaner because they did not have an array here. They actually just used four variables. So I'll actually just copy and paste that here. In case you're wondering why they did this all in one line, because it does look like a little less readable, it's because of the same reason I kind of did these here, the same reason I created a temporary array, because you don't want to change one of these before you get a chance to change all of the other ones. So that's why Leak Code has all of these in one one line assignment. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.